And my name is Dr. Eric North. I'm with the University of Minnesota in urban and community forestry. And today I'll be presenting on engaging the unengaged, improving urban forest through community involvement. And we're gonna look at this in a few different uh, uh, ways. So one of the challenges in working with uh, the public when working with students is that there's this idea of plant blindness where people see trees as ever present and unchanging. If you have a large tree in your environment, you might not notice it so much or the average person, these are normal people, non-arborists, non-urban foresters might not notice that that tree is there and that that tree is going through lots of changes, but they only see it as a, as a big presence. They notice it when it's gone, but they don't notice it always when it's there. And that's a, a challenge to overcome when you're trying to get people engaged in urban forestry, in arboriculture, thinking of it both as how they can work within their community, but also thinking about it as a potential career and what they might want to do. So this was a really interesting article that talks about uh, people just see it kind of as a green wall in front of them. And so part of the challenge of engaging folks is not just to care, but to actually start to recognize and see the green plants and the trees around them. In working in Minnesota, we had a disastrous opportunity in many communities in North America, particularly the eastern half of the United States, uh, have been dealing with this. This is the emerald ash borer. It's an invasive insect. And whether or not you're familiar with the emerald ash borer in your community, uh, there are invasive insects and pests in urban forests all over the world. And really figuring out how to deal with those in bigger communities where there's lots of uh, funding and opportunities and, and expertise, it can be still challenging, but a little bit easier. In smaller communities where they lack maybe the expertise and the funding, there's uh, issues with thinking about how do we address this? So we wanted to take this disastrous uh, thing that's happening, invasive pests, and turn it into an opportunity. And we turned that into an opportunity to engage with communities in a program we called Community Engagement and Preparedness. This is a small community in uh, southern Minnesota, Hendricks, a town of around 700 people. So they clearly didn't have the budget or the expertise to deal with this invasive pest all on their own. And they needed to think about uh, how they could in involve citizens to help them understand better what, how this invasive pest was going to impact their community. So we came up with the project. The project purpose, the primary purpose of the project was to do inventories. So this wasn't just in the town of Hendricks. These were in several small towns. And really we wanted to look at the communities didn't know how many trees they had. They didn't know what kind of trees they had. And so they didn't really have a good understanding of how EAB or this invasive pest was going to impact their communities and what that might cost and what that might look like after this pest had come through their communities. So our first purpose was to, we just need to collect data. And we did that. So we can have these charts and graphs and you're not really supposed to be able to read these charts and graphs. It's just a, a representation to show you, yeah, we got lots of data. That's really great. We, we know how many trees are in public land. We know how many trees are in private land. We know what genus and what species level. We know what size they are. So that was the, the basic project purpose, this overarching idea. Um, the other part of this is to remember that it's urban and community forestry and community engagement. Here we had lots of folks that would get together as they're learning about how to identify trees. They're learning how to do inventories of trees and they're, they're learning how to measure trees, but we also took time to sit down with them, have a meal, share some food. I know in the pandemic, uh, this maybe is an uncomfortable photo to look at. Nobody's wearing masks and they're all sitting a little too close together, but hopefully at some point when we return to maybe a pre-pandemic world, you know, this is something to think about. It, under the pandemic where we maybe can't be as close to, with each other, even having uh, calls online where everybody's, you can see everybody's face. And so you're building a sense of community. So we wanted data, that was the primary purpose. But the secondary purpose 
shouldn't be seen as any lesser of a purpose. So that was to engage the community, an engaged community that cares about the resource and has some bonding experiences over that resource will help to protect that resource, help to make it a little bit better as they go throughout uh, their sort of other lives. These are not foresters. These are not trained people looking at forestry. These are just the citizens in the community that care about what's happening. And part of it, they care about because they know their neighbors. They know the other people in the community and they're interested in helping to make sure that community does well. So the community inventories, we can let's look at what the communities were that we actually looked at. So we, the original project, uh, the original piece of the project were about 14 communities, which averaged out to around 140 volunteers. So about 10 or so volunteers per community. And these communities ranged in size from maybe 700 people up to around 90 to 100,000 people. So really good uh, range for the smaller uh, section of the communities. We wanted people to be able to do tree identification. That's one of the basic parts of any tree inventory. You have to know what species or genus exist. And particularly when dealing with pests or pathogens, it's important uh, that we understand um, what's there and what might be impacted. We also wanted uh, the folks to be able to measure uh, the trees so that they understood exactly what size uh, trees they were dealing with. So was emerald ash borer or this invasive pest only going to impact the very smallest trees or was it going to impact the very biggest trees? And after EAB left, maybe there's another pest that comes down the road and what, what next tree species would be impacted and how big are those trees? And, and getting uh, people out to measure those, uh, we had an, an idea, not just how many trees, but what size of trees are we talking about? And we wanted to know some sort of condition rating for the trees. So um, this idea is important. Uh, you know, if you want to have a management strategy where you say we're going to remove the worst trees um, and we're going to keep the best trees, we want to see well how how do we know where the worst and the best are? Are all of the trees in great shape? Are all of the trees in our community in poor shape? And we wanted to go beyond the good, fair, poor sort of rating systems to give people really understanding so that they could look very closely at different aspects of the trees in order to give the community uh, the tools they needed to manage for this particular pest or pathogen. All of this has been written up and published a couple of years ago and there was a great uh, series of articles that came out um, in the ISA's journal that looked at many different ways that communities were getting involved in sort of citizen science and community engagement. And so you can see here we did an analysis of the agreement between uh, volunteer and researcher data, and we specifically chose the word agreement as opposed to volunteer accuracy because there was no guarantee that we were as researchers 100% accurate. And so we wanted to see how well did the volunteers um, do their uh, do the inventory compared to if, if you had hired uh, trained professionals or researchers to do it, that would maybe be the gold standard, not perfect, there's always mistakes, but can volunteers approach to uh, researcher or paid uh, professionals. So we started out, we thought, well, we've got to train folks and we should probably write a manual because they're not gonna remember everything we say and everything we do and these projects are gonna take uh, several months to complete. So we should make sure we write a manual. So being scientists, we very detailed, had a lot of specifics. It was 62 pages. We knew what stuff looked like. So we didn't put a lot of images in it and we gave it uh, to the volunteers who promptly looked at it and looked at the 62 pages and thought I'm volunteering. And then they set the manual down and then they just listened to us and tried to remember the best they could. That was first approach. So we had about nine or so communities or six or so communities in the first group that came under this approach. Then we added more communities later. For the second approach, once we had the first six communities go through this round, we then said, well, we made some mistakes. So we created a second manual. We learned from our mistakes, which is what we should all hopefully be doing. And we decided less is more. So we wrote less. We did less specifics and we tried to just highlight the key points. We, these aren't, we weren't training professionals, in other words. We were training engaged citizens and we thought we just need to, they just need to know how to do these very uh, simple portions of the task. 
And so we reduced this to only 25 pages long and had it added many, many more images so that really what they could do with a little bit of text is look back at the picture and go, oh, I should try to make it look something like that. Uh, people seem to actually use these. We noticed people were carrying them around with them, made the manual a little bit smaller, easier to take out into the field. And so this we felt was probably more helpful for folks. We also had to do tree identification. Clearly most of the people um, maybe knew a few trees here and there, but certainly not all of the different species that might be, uh, that they might encounter in the field. First, again, very detailed. We're scientists, we're thinking, you know, they need to get exactly down to the, the species ID level. Here you can see this gentleman in the training session. He's got a hand lens out and he's looking at petioles and he's looking at leaf scars and bundle scars and, and buds and everything to see, like, can I key this out? And we gave them keys so they could do a dichotomist key to try and figure out exactly what species they're doing. And, uh, it seemed to wear on some people a little more than others where it was kind of exhausting and they thought it would be sort of fun to learn how to identify and then they look at this really detailed approach and we realized that in terms of the general project thinking about invasive pest management we really needed them to identify how many ash not how many white ash versus green ash versus blue ash or black ash we really just needed to know well how many ash do you have and that's good enough. If you can get us to species, that's great, but we really need this, this genus level identification. So our second approach with the next communities was to really focus on the basics. What do bark look like? What do leaves look like? And we had them, they were all doing the interview, or the, excuse me, the um, inventory during leaf on season. So, you know, knowing exactly what the buds are while interesting and important. Um, maybe wasn't as important for this particular project. So we focused on the bigger features. We focused on, can you get us to genus? Can you understand and tell us what an ash is? And then we also created these tree ID cards. And these cards were formatted to be about four inches by six inches. And then we laminated the cards for them. So they would have a customized uh, tree ID guidebook essentially that they could take out. And we actually customized these for each community. So we took photos of trees that existed in Minnesota communities, and then we figured out which trees were most likely to be found in each of the different communities. If you're not familiar with Minnesota, it's longer north to south than it is wide east to west. And so there might be different trees in the north south than there were in, or excuse me, in the southern portion of the state than there were in the northern. So we sort of mixed and matched cards to give them just the ones that they were most likely to encounter. They can then take these cards around with them and help match up pictures and things of that nature as we go. We also wanted them to do tree measurements. And here you can see a, a couple of uh, folks going out and we gave them diameter tapes um, and we also gave them just measuring tapes in general so they could measure both uh, trunk diameter or DBH and crown width and so measuring trunk diameter was fairly simple because they could just wrap the tape around and call out a single number so that one uh, turned out to be fairly easy to train and we didn't have a lot of differences between the two training approaches where we noticed a bigger training difference in between the groups was when we went to measure crown width. Now, what we trained each volunteer to do was to learn their pace. So we'd measure out about 100 feet on the ground, and then we'd have them walk from, from 0 to 100, and they'd count how many uh, paces, so how many two-step sequences that they would do. We noticed that the men took giant steps and the women seemed to take a little bit smaller steps or, or quite honestly more normal steps the way you would actually walk and and then you'd see what you see in this image here people are looking up at the tree and they're trying to figure out where's the edge of the tree and then they're walking in and so they ran into each other a lot kind of some tripping falling hazards and clearly some of these trees were going out into streets and so we had to have another person there watching for traffic to make sure that nobody was of course walking into cars or vehicles and you know it's not that accurate as it turns out if you measure your pace and then you're really starting to focus on something else you change how big a steps you take or how small a steps you take so for the second approach, we came up with this. What if we just give them another tape measure and they can wrap it around the trunk at about a 90 degree angle. So they're getting two different sides of the tree 
and then the person holding the end of the, the tape measure can simply call out the number and that would give a rough average of the crown width. We had much more consistent results in doing it this way and it was much less confusing for people and quite honestly it probably ended up being a little bit safer because they could pay more attention to where they were walking and then just read the tape at the end as opposed to having to look up and also be counting and, and all those things which it's not that that's difficult but if it's something you've never done before it's it, something you need to keep in mind when training and working with the volunteers. So condition rating, we wanted to go beyond good, fair, poor. And this is just an image that we used in one of the guidebooks. If you can read it, that's, that's okay. But really just to, to give you an idea, we put an image in here, we had an arrow pointing at what the defect was, and then we had a brief description of that defect. So people that needed a little more information could look at this and say, okay, I, I understand now what this picture is, is representing. We then created a point system. So instead of saying, oh, that's, that's a lot of decay, they could rate the decay on a four point scale. There were several categories we had each of the volunteers look at for every tree. We broke the categories loosely into what's in the crown. So what's in the upper part of the tree. So they would assess about four or five things in the crown and write down a point value. And then we had them look very specifically at the trunk or the stem of the tree. And they again assessed four or five characteristics and gave a point value to each of those. They could then add those up to provide a numeric scale for each the trunk and the crown. We could then look at that information once they were finished to determine, well, now using those numbers, we could then more consistently break them out into groupings to say, well, the trees that scored the most points, we could maybe call those excellent and we could break them out after the fact. But this gave something volunteers very specific to focus on. In our training, this first, um, you see the Andy, the young woman there holding up a leaf and we're going real specifically looking at, and they're in a classroom and the classroom training was hours long and we usually started, it was cold outside, so people didn't mind too much, but then we'd just go outside and do some field training and then we kind of left. In the second one, you see the field training. The second round, we really focused far more on the field training. We gave it a little bit of classroom stuff, but we shortened the number of hours considerably so that people could really focus on the primary uh, objective, which was identify the tree, measure the tree. Those are the important parts. And so we were able to then um, spend a little more time in the field. And what really turned out to be a big difference between this sort of first round of training and the second round of training, we trained a little bit less in the second round but we added more time for technical assistance. So we trained them and then we said, the first time you go out to start your inventory, call us up and we'll walk around with you so that if a question arises, we're right there. You can just ask us, we'll answer your question and you keep going. We tried to stay quiet and just let them uh, uh, do what they were doing and only responded if it was clear they were making a mistake or if it was clear that they had a question and then we could address that question right then and there and not worry about it. Um, in the first grouping, what happened was we let them go out on their own and then we said, just call us if you have questions. Well, you know, people get busy or, or uh, they didn't want to bother us or they'd call us and then it would take us a day or two to get back to them. And by that point, they'd already finished a bunch of things. Um, and so they got better on the second uh, piece they might inventory, but clearly our response time was, was a little slower. And so that technical assistance piece and focusing more on actually the field training and not worrying as much about the classroom training, just enough so that when we did the field training, they, the volunteers understood what it was that we were talking about. So we also created web resources in today's world. It's fairly easy to get a website up and running. And so we, we put all the manuals and we put all the photo ID cards and all the community resources online so that they could quickly access that and they could download some other documents as well, um, tree owners manual and the ID cards. So they could use them and if they lost some, they could print out their own or if they wanted to extend the community even further or the volunteers that they're working with even more, they had uh, information that they could then work with that was available online. 
So to give you an idea of the volunteer demographics, we didn't uh, count volunteers or do a lot of demographic information and we didn't segment it out by community. We just sort of did it as a project as a whole. So we don't have anything formally written up about this part of the research. But this gives you a rough idea. So most of our volunteers were in the 51 to 60 year old range. Um, at first we thought maybe most of our volunteers were retired folks that had extra time. Uh, we're not really sure, most of them were not retired. Most were still working. And so uh, we're not really sure uh, exactly why it seemed to be the older uh, folks that were still working, but we think possibly uh, that these were people whose, if they had children, had already uh, gone off to college or had graduated college. And so now maybe had a little more time that they could spend just working around in their community. We had some high school students, but pretty low. Um, and then we had some in that 20 to 40 range, but again, fairly low. So it wasn't until people maybe were more established in their community, maybe had a little more uh, time that they could give back to the community. Um, that, that's really the bulk of the volunteers that we had. In terms of educational levels, um, really didn't see anything consistent. If we take those first two where it says high school education, high school diploma, you know, that's a little more than 20%. If we take the associate's degree, which is a two-year degree in the U.S., and the technical degrees tend to be two years degrees in, in the U.S., and let's combine those, that's about 20 people. Bachelor's degrees, a four-year degree is about 20%. Master's degrees, maybe a little higher, and then PhDs, uh, what can I say? Once you get your PhD, you, you stop working, I guess. Um, it, it could be that none of the, or very few of the communities had a university in, within the community. And so PhDs might just have been a little lower based on where the communities were. But we can see that education level was not that telling. So we got people all across that spectrum of education that were interested in giving back to their community. Uh, what we really noticed was a big indicator of, of how much people might volunteer or be interested in volunteering was how long they had lived in the community. And people that had lived in the community at least 20 years seemed the most interested in giving back, which was great. Volunteer performance. So let's say we, we, they went out, we trained them, they went out and started working on things. How did they actually perform? Well, if you look at the species column, you'll see that man, it's anywhere from about 40% agreement. So they went out and said it was a maple and then we went out and said, nope, that's an oak. So that would be a disagreement. If we went out and they went out and said, volunteers said it was a maple and we said it was a maple, that means we agreed. Or silver maple and silver maple more specifically for species. So the lowest community in Hibbing being about 40% to the highest community, about 84% agreement in Ely. If we switch over to the next column of genus, you can see really there was not a community below 90% and not really a community, 94% agreement was the lowest that we had. And that's really, that's really quite good. We move to the next category, you can see DBH. I was surprised and, and I think the other researchers were surprised that DBH was kind of as low as it was. Uh, 50%, you think you're just wrapping a tape around, that should be fairly simple to read off that number. If we gave ourselves plus or minus 2.5 centimeters or plus or minus an inch, we saw that these climbed up quite readily. And so maybe people weren't doing it exactly at four and a half feet or 1.3 meters off the ground. So they were up or down. Maybe they weren't pulling the tape quite as tight. Maybe it was a little crooked. And so within an inch or so, numbers jumped up when we analyzed this for two inches, you know, we got very, very good agreement, 90s uh, plus percent in pretty much every community. Crown width, that's the CRW. Oh, it was abysmal. You can see that the, the lowest agreement was 1% of the time, um, up to a maximum of 21% of the time. And then if we said, well, crown width plus or minus 1.5 meters, about five feet, we could see that that really uh, increased pretty well. Not great, but it's a little more complicated measure. You could maybe you pick different sides of the tree to measure, that sort of thing, tape low. Maybe it wasn't quite 90 degrees, all of those things. And condition rating, again, a little more complicated task. And we weren't doing it the very next day. So we went back maybe at sometimes a season later. So condition maybe has changed a bit. And it's a little more subjective, even with the numeric scale. Here we can, we analyze the difference between method number one and method number two. Method number two performed better in all of the categories, although really only significantly better in 
um, DBH measurement and the crown width measurement. Um, in terms of genus and species ID level, maybe it was better, but maybe not statistically significantly better. Um, but for the more complicated tasks of measuring and condition, method two seemed a much better approach. And this is essentially detailing out that if you, uh, if you assume that they use method one, we can see that for DBH measurement, we were about one and a half times more likely to agree with method two than we were with method one and up to two twice as, as likely to agree on crown width measurement within about one and a half meters or five feet. So method two really focusing on um, simplifying the manual and doing more time outside and providing that technical assistance, that really seemed to be the key in terms of increasing our agreement with the volunteers. question has come up and so we published some information on well what trees did people get right or wrong and so we wanted to take a look at this and see okay here are all the trees now we didn't really have large enough numbers of trees in each of the the genera to make a good statistical comparison so these are just the the sort of the raw information and you can see that there were a few like abies and some of the picea and pinus so these would be conifers uh, where the agreement was maybe a little less when it came to species, pretty good when it came to genus. Um, this led ultimately uh, later down the line to, to an understanding that maybe the, the species that are really close together or look really familiar, people had a little harder time identifying. I ultimately ended up creating this pine not a pine video. Uh, it's on YouTube, you can take a look at it. it to, to explain to people, not everything with green needles in a cone is a pine, right? We have pine spruces and firs. There are some other things in there as well. And so we sort of learned how to work with volunteers a little better. How do we figure out what the, the tree species or, or genera they might have trouble with? How can, we, how can we help them get past that? The value of engagement beyond. Um, this gentleman uh, right here, Dustin, uh, he was one of our volunteers and Dustin has now gone on to um, become, he came back to school, studied urban forestry. Uh, another uh, of the volunteers, Derek over here, looks quite happy. He went back and learned how, uh, got a master's degree in urban forestry. And so in working with the volunteers, we actually encourage not only community engagement, but actually coming back, learning more and getting involved in the industry. And we had another community that they were too small to have their own tree care department, but they raised funds so that they could pay an arborist uh, on a regular basis to come and help prune trees. And they worked with the, the county level um, to help get an, an inventory management system, even though the city itself couldn't afford it. So they got really engaged after this. And that was fantastic, fantastic way to work with the community and really broaden what they were going to do. So there are all these ancillary benefits, and that's that engagement of the community piece that's important. Well, let's move on to a different idea. We had a delicious opportunity here. This is still coming out of this emerald ash borer, and this was in the city of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And some, uh, I, I'm part of this group with, with other friends and colleagues. We decided there's a whole bunch of uh, new breweries, craft breweries, making delicious beer and we all liked beer and we all liked trees. And so we thought, my goodness, Minneapolis is going through uh, removing trees because of emerald ash borer and replanting trees. Wouldn't it be great if we could partner these things up? So Minneapolis at the time was replacing around 8,000 trees a year. Um, and they were curious and wanted to make sure new tree survival. So trees needed to be watered and things like that. And these craft breweries tended to be community based. So a brewery would open up in a community and then they really reached out to the community to make it a community space. So we wanted to see if we could leverage that, uh, maybe look at some trees and maybe have a beer here or there as well. So the program, very simple, the city plants a tree. A citizen agrees to adopt the tree and basically water the tree. And then we worked with our partner breweries to give people a uh, free beer for agreeing to water the tree throughout the course of the first uh, couple of seasons of growing. We worked with the city of Minneapolis, again, really the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, um, which is separate from the city, but manages all the trees in the parks to set up a website to import all the trees that people could then click on the tree they wanted and adopt that tree. 
So really great. And then we'd get a notification and, and we'd send them out a token for a free, a free beer at either a brewery and we did partner up with a coffee shop as well. So at last check, we were trying to get to around 2,020 individual adopters and over, it should say over 2,000 trees, sorry, a little mistake there on the slide, but over 2,000 trees adopted, seven breweries, I think we're at a few more than that now, one coffee shop and some other partners. There's a, a running series, the brewery running series does a great job. People for Parks, which is a nonprofit in Minneapolis, helped give us the seed money. And of course, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board has been a fantastic partner to get the project up and running. And we see, try to do lots of events, including an Arbor Day event and some other communities to really do two things, increase young tree survival and broaden awareness of urban forestry. And I think so far that we're doing it, it's a little hard to gauge exactly how that works, but it's a way that we can uh, work with that and make sure that uh, people are really appreciating what they have in their communities. So moving on to just thinking about how we can engage a bit more in other ways. So arboriculture, I always like to tell my students, uh, I teach classes at a university, and so I like to tell the students, um, arboriculture has a, a culture of community and safety. And some of you may recognize the gentleman in the yellow shirt here. This is Dr. John Ball. And he's been a great partner to help with various, but really anybody that kind of reaches out to John, he's always ha happy to lend a hand. And so we partnered with them when I was working for the University of Nebraska to get his students down and my students down to do a climbing uh, event. And really what a great thing to see people work together. So this is another opportunity to engage. Not all of my students are gonna be arborists, but they're gonna be hopefully productive citizens and, and having them learn a little bit more about the field and the industry is an important aspect. Uh, I, I have a tendency to rope in other faculty. Here you can see uh, the woman standing on the deck there. She's a good friend of mine. She's actually a limnologist, a scientist that studies water, inland water. And there's me climbing in a tree. This was, we were chatting and she came up with this idea that, oh, what we should really do is uh, after the 4th of July, there's all the fireworks. We should look at how much firework residue leaves capture in trees. She was interested in water and how much residue might end up in water. And I like trees. And I said, well, we could climb the tree and figure out how much is on there. Um, and she was really excited about that. And this uh, is another faculty member. He's actually a statistician in population ecology. And he and I have started working on projects because he saw me out teaching students how to climb trees. And he got really interested and said, oh, what, what other stuff do you do in trees? And so really just that engagement piece uh, was roping in other folks to come and say, yeah, this would be really interesting. How else can we work together? What other questions or problems can we solve? I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I know educators often attend these events. And so a little bit about engaging students in, in a boar culture and in, in urban forestry. Uh, this is a group of students that came through a, a class, and here you can see them looking at wood samples and soil samples and all sorts of things to engage them. Um, I did also a study abroad trip in uh, Botswana, and this is what students wanted to see. Uh, they wanted to see the elephants, of course. And when I told them, like, we're going to also learn a little bit about plants, they thought, I'm not that interested in learning about plants, right? Um, but by the end, they were looking at this and they were saying, oh, look behind the Mopani. There's a, there's a cute little uh, baby hyena, right? So was it perfect? No, but they could at least identify the tree and realize that the trees were an important part of, of the environment that they were going to be working in and hope to work in. And by the end, we had students hugging the trees and really excited to see and, and spotting them in the landscape behind. Usually they were looking past the tree to, to at some other wildlife, but really still quite excited to understand some of the trees. And some of them form some personal bonds with the trees themselves. I give out this photo assignment. And again, the text isn't really there for you to read through. Uh, but this is an assignment where I have students go out to try and find defects in the urban forest and then write up what the defect is and how they might solve it. And, you know, as an educator, I think this is a nice assignment, but, you know, it probably stays in the classroom for most students. Well, this is 
a, a student several years later because of that photo assignment continued to be involved in looking at trees and he's studying to be a physician now so not going to be an arborist but still looking around at trees and he sent me this email and i just want to highlight this he said i felt personally offended when i saw this pruning uh, that happened on this tree and i just had to share it with someone and you know and he's given me permission to use this in class but really that, that spoke a lot to me and i've had many students send in um, emails and photos of trees they encounter either at their family's house or wherever just to say wow you know i was really uh, engaged about about trees and I, they might have chosen a different career but now they're maybe better consumers maybe they're more likely to be involved and engaged in urban forestry at other levels and i'd like to say it's you're never too young this is a, a tree uh, every year i would collect uh, Christmas trees from friends and neighbors and then I cut them in half and I bring them into the arboriculture class so they can see how branches are attached on the inside and things like that and my friend's young daughter Petra was really interested to see how I did this so I was like what the heck here's a chainsaw you cut it in half no, I'm kidding um, she was really interested so she wanted to come over and watch me saw a tree in half and um, so very engaged and then during the pandemic you know she's at home and, and bored and started asking tree questions which led to this I uh, kind of came up with a YouTube channel answering Petra's questions anything uh, that the students had or that the kids had and I started having parents send in little videos of their kids asking tree questions this one you can see do trees go potty I mean it's hard to keep a straight face occasionally when answering some of these questions, but it was a lot of fun little project videos of two or three minutes long as a way to provide extra engagement. Um, and then there are great things that are happening at the University of Minnesota, youth education and arboriculture, Chad Giblin and the crew there, you can check out the website, lots of great folks involved in doing this um, project and really amazing to help build up not only the awareness of their parents and the students, but to maybe help build in new engagement at all levels, that younger level as well as the older levels. I try to get involved in any event that asks about trees or can I contribute something. This is a high school event for women in science. We had a great time showing people there's a great career for men, women, no matter who you are, there are opportunities in forestry, urban forestry and arboriculture. And sometimes you have to get a little creative, right? So this is actually, this is a group from the Arbor Day Foundation that was really interested in learning how to climb trees that came out with me one day. And we got them all up in the tree so they could kind of practice going up and down to have some appreciation of forestry and urban forestry, what really goes into the professionals. And that this is a highly trained, highly skilled uh, career and industry. And some of the events you can see where did this fall lend themselves to social distancing. This is a six foot long saw. So the students wearing their masks, proper PPE, always important. Um, and so they were able to do that. And I try to climb uh, during other events that are happening. So if the campus recruiters say, hey, we're gonna be walking around the university. I get out climbing gear and I get a couple of students to come out with me. It's not so much to engage the people, not so much to get the people walking by climbing, but so they can see and they start asking questions. How do I get involved in that class? Uh, we've hosted movie nights. This is a documentary, The Trees. Maybe some have seen it about the building of the 9-11 uh, Memorial uh, in New York City and all the different people from the tree folks, the architects, the landscape architects, uh, to really make this part of a project. And then we had a question and answer. So really great and a lot of fun uh, in that regard. And we host tree, tree, tree themed trivias, it's hard to say, uh, in, a, in a science cafe. I mean, look at this. This guy showed up unprompted with drink beer, plant trees. I mean, how great is that? And we had a really fun time uh, working to, to talk a little bit about trees, but also have some just fun trivia uh, about trees and, and people could have uh, their favorite beverage while they, they listened and participated with the hope that they would take that out with them uh, later on. Shameless self-promotion, I mean marketing, it's called marketing, right? So anytime we were doing an event, we tried to call people to come take pictures, come out, investigate what we're doing. Um, this was when I first came to the University of Nebraska before I went back to the University of Minnesota to, to get people engaged. I got involved with a, a local extension program where they put a, a, a 
PBS channel and so talked about how do you hire an arborist and then some scientists called me up for those of you that are in the Marvel universe and said hey I really want to know a reporter said I want to know what Groot's growth rate uh, Groot the Marvel character what his growth rate would be scientifically speaking and we sat down and had a two-hour long conversation where I actually uh, came up with math models and, and gave him graphs, which he published in this article. I was kind of surprised to see and maybe a little embarrassed to say this is probably one of my most read contributions to science, uh, but really great. I had people finding this and emailing me about it and, and thinking maybe we reached out to folks that trees and forestry are, are a fun and interesting idea um, to engage in, in any sector of the community. Well, I want to thank everybody uh, 